Part One of Boule de Suif by Guy de Maupassant. For several days in succession, fragments of a defeated army had passed through the town. They were mere disorganized bands, not disciplined forces. The men wore long, dirty beards and tattered uniforms. They advanced in listless fashion, without a flag, without a leader. All seemed exhausted, worn out, incapable of thought or resolve, marching onward merely by force of habit, and dropping to the ground with fatigue the moment they halted. One saw in particular many enlisted men, peaceful citizens, men who lived quietly on their income, bending beneath the weight of their rifles, and little active volunteers, easily frightened but full of enthusiasm, as eager to attack as they were ready to take to flight. And amid these, a sprinkling of red-breeched soldiers, the pitiful remnant of a division cut down in a great battle, somber artillerymen side by side with nondescript foot soldiers, and here and there the gleaming helmet of a heavy-footed dragoon who had difficulty in keeping up with the quicker pace of the soldiers of the line. Legions of irregulars with high-sounding names, avengers of defeat, citizens of the tomb, brethren in death, passed in their turn, looking like banditti. Their leaders, former drapers or grain merchants, or tallow or soap chandlers, warriors by force of circumstances, officers by reason of their mustachios or their money, covered with weapons, flannel and gold lace, spoke in an impressive manner, discussed plans of campaign, and behaved as though they alone bore the fortunes of dying France on their braggart shoulders, though in truth they frequently were afraid of their own men. Scoundrels, often brave beyond measure, but pillagers and debauchees. Rumor had it that the Prussians were about to enter Rouen. The members of the National Guard, who for the past two months had been reconnoitering with the utmost caution in the neighboring woods, occasionally shooting their own sentinels, and making ready for fight whenever a rabbit rustled in the undergrowth, had now returned to their homes. Their arms, their uniforms, all the death-dealing paraphernalia with which they had terrified all the milestones along the high road for eight miles round, had suddenly and marvelously disappeared. The last of the French soldiers had just crossed the Seine on their way to pont aux dumay through saint sever and Bourgachard, and in their rear the vanquished general, powerless to do aught with the forlorn remnants of his army, himself dismayed at the final overthrow of a nation accustomed to victory and disastrously beaten despite its legendary bravery, walked between two orderlies. Then a profound calm, a shuddering silent dread, settled on the city. Many a round-paunched citizen, emasculated by years devoted to business, anxiously awaited the conquerors, trembling lest his roasting jacks or kitchen knives should be looked upon as weapons. Life seemed to have stopped short, the shops were shut, the streets deserted. Now and then an inhabitant, awed by the silence, glided swiftly by in the shadow of the walls. The anguish of suspense made men even desire the arrival of the enemy. In the afternoon of the day following the departure of the French troops, a number of Uhlans, coming no one knew whence, passed rapidly through the town. A little later on, a black mass descended St. Catherine's Hill, while two other invading bodies appeared respectively on the Dornetal and the Bois-Guillaume roads. The advance guards of the three corps arrived at precisely the same moment at the square of the Hôtel de Ville, and the German army poured through all the adjacent streets, its battalions making the pavement ring with their firm measured tread. Orders, shouted in an unknown guttural tongue, rose to the windows of the seemingly dead, deserted houses, while behind the fast-closed shutters eager eyes peered forth at the victors, masters now of the city, its fortunes, and its lives by right of war. 
The inhabitants in their darkened rooms were possessed by that terror which follows in the wake of cataclysms, of deadly upheavals of the earth, against which all human skill and strength are vain. For the same thing happens whenever the established order of things is upset, when security no longer exists, when all those rights usually protected by the law of man or of nature are at the mercy of unreasoning savage force. The earthquake crushing a whole nation under falling roofs, the flood let loose and engulfing in its swirling depths the corpses of drowned peasants, along with dead oxen and beams torn from shattered houses. Or the army, covered with glory, murdering those who defend themselves, making prisoners of the rest, pillaging in the name of the sword, and giving thanks to God to the thunder of cannon. All these are appalling scourges, which destroy all belief in eternal justice, all that confidence we have been taught to feel in the protection of heaven and the reason of man. Small detachments of soldiers knocked at each door, and then disappeared within the houses, for the vanquished saw they would have to be civil to their conquerors. At the end of a short time, once the first terror had subsided, Calm was again restored. In many houses the Prussian officer ate at the same table with the family. He was often well-bred, and, out of politeness, expressed sympathy with France, and repugnance at being compelled to take part in the war. This sentiment was received with gratitude. Besides, his protection might be needful some day or other. By the exercise of tact, the number of men quartered in one's house might be reduced. And why should one provoke the hostility of a person on whom one's whole welfare depended? Such conduct would savor less of bravery than of foolhardiness. And foolhardiness is no longer a failing of the citizens of Rouen, as it was in the days when their city earned renown by its heroic defenses. Last of all, final argument based on the national politeness. The folk of Rouen said to one another that it was only right to be civil in one's own house, provided there was no public exhibition of familiarity with the foreigner. Out of doors, therefore, citizen and soldier did not know each other, but in the house both chatted freely, and each evening the German remained a little longer, warming himself at the hospitable hearth. Even the town itself resumed by degrees its ordinary aspect. The French seldom walked abroad, but the streets swarmed with Prussian soldiers. Moreover, the officers of the Blue Hussars, who arrogantly dragged their instruments of death along the pavements, seemed to hold the simple townsmen in but little more contempt than did the French cavalry officers, who had drunk at the same cafés the year before. But there was something in the air, a something strange and subtle, an intolerable foreign atmosphere, like a penetrating odor, the odor of invasion. It permeated dwellings and places of public resort, changed the taste of food, made one imagine oneself in far distant lands amid dangerous barbaric tribes. The conquerors exacted money, much money. The inhabitants paid what was asked. They were rich. But the wealthier a Norman tradesman becomes, the more he suffers at having to part with anything that belongs to him, at having to see any portion of his substance pass into the hands of another. Nevertheless, within six or seven miles of the town, along the course of the river as it flows onward to Croisset, Diapedal, and Biesar, Boatmen and fishermen often haul to the surface of the water the body of a German, bloated in his uniform, killed by a blow from knife or club, his head crushed by a stone, or, perchance, pushed from some bridge into the stream below. The mud of the riverbed swallowed up these obscure acts of vengeance, savage yet legitimate, these unrecorded deeds of bravery, these silent attacks fraught with greater danger than battles fought in broad day, and surrounded, moreover, with no halo of romance. For hatred of the foreigner ever arms a few intrepid souls ready to die for an idea. 
At last, as the invaders, though subjecting the town to the strictest discipline, had not committed any of the deeds of horror with which they had been credited while on their triumphal march, the people grew bolder, and the necessities of business again animated the breasts of a local merchants. Some of these had important commercial interests at Havre, occupied at present by the French army, and wished to attempt to reach that port by overland route to Dieppe, taking the boat from there. Through the influence of the German officers whose acquaintance they had made, they obtained a permit to leave town from the general in command. A large four-horse coach having therefore been engaged for the journey, and ten passengers having given in their names to the proprietor, they decided to start on a certain Tuesday morning before daybreak to avoid attracting a crowd. The ground had been frozen hard for some time past, and about three o'clock on Monday afternoon, large black clouds from the north shed their burden of snow uninterruptedly all through that evening and night. At half-past four in the morning, the travellers met in the courtyard of the Hôtel de Normandie, where they were to take their seats in the coach. They were still half asleep and shivering with cold under their wraps. They could see one another but indistinctly in the darkness, and the mountain of heavy winter wraps in which each was swathed made them look like a gathering of obese priests in their long cassocks. But two men recognized each other. A third accosted them, and the three began to talk. "'I am bringing my wife,' said one. "'So am I. And I, too,' the first speaker added. "'We shall not return to Rouen, and if the Prussians approach Havre, we will cross to England.' All three, it turned out, had made the same plans, being of similar disposition and temperament. Still, the horses were not harnessed. A small lantern carried by a stable boy emerged now and then from one dark doorway to disappear immediately in another. The stamping of horses' hooves, deadened by the dung and straw of the stable, was heard from time to time, and from inside the building issued a man's voice, talking to the animals and swearing at them. A faint tinkle of bells showed that the harness was being got ready. This tinkle soon developed into a continuous jingling, louder or softer according to the movements of the horse, sometimes stopping altogether, then breaking out in a sudden peal, accompanied by a pawing of the ground by an iron-shod hoof. The door suddenly closed. All noise ceased. The frozen townsmen were silent. They remained motionless, stiff with cold. A thick curtain of glistening white flakes fell ceaselessly to the ground. It obliterated all outlines, enveloped all objects in an icy mantle of foam. Nothing was to be heard throughout the length and breadth of the silent winter-bound city save the vague, nameless rustle of falling snow, a sensation rather than a sound, the gentle mingling of light atoms which seemed to fill all space, to cover the whole world. The man reappeared with his lantern, leading by a rope a melancholy-looking horse, evidently being led out against his inclination. The hostler placed himself beside the pole, fastened the traces, and spent some time in walking round him to make sure that the harness was all right, for he could use only one hand, the other being engaged in holding the lantern. As he was about to fetch the second horse, he noticed the motionless group of travellers, already white with snow, and said to them, well, Why don't you get inside the coach? You'd be under shelter, at least. This did not seem to have occurred to them, and they at once took his advice. The three men seated their wives at the far end of the coach, then got in themselves. Lastly, the other vague, snow-shrouded forms clambered to the remaining places without a word. The floor was covered with straw, into which the feet sank. The ladies at the far end, having brought with them little copper foot-warmers, heated by means of a kind of chemical fuel, proceeded to light these, and spent some time expatiating in low tones on their advantages, saying over and over again the things which they had all known for a long time. 
At last, six horses instead of four, having been harnessed to the diligence, on account of the heavy roads, a voice outside asked, Is everyone there? To which a voice from the interior replied, Yes. And they set out. The vehicle moved slowly, slowly, at a snail's pace. The wheels sank into the snow. The entire body of the coach creaked and groaned. The horses slipped, puffed, steamed, and the coachman's long whip cracked incessantly, flying hither and thither, calling up, then flinging out its length like a slender serpent, as it lashed some rounded flank, which instantly grew tense as it strained in further effort. But the day grew apace. Those light flakes, which one traveller, a native of Rouen, had compared to a rain of cotton, fell no longer. A murky light filtered through dark heavy clouds, which made the country more dazzlingly white by contrast, a whiteness broken sometimes by a row of tall trees spangled with hoar-frost, or by a cottage roof hooded in snow. 